So good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this lecture on software design. Then uh, the last uh, two, three lectures in this, this class on software technology, we've been uh, talking about, well, software architecture, high level decisions and so on. And now we will start to move down the hierarchy uh, closer to, to uh, well, the code, really. And, and today's lecture will, will give you a, a sort of an introduction to, to, uh, to what software design is all about. And I will give you a couple of examples of, of design decisions that you will uh, face during the uh, uh, design activities. And I will also try to show you uh, the distinction between architectural level and, and, and what uh, most people call detailed design so, so that you would will get a better understanding of, 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 uh, of that. And uh, At the end of the lecture we will also uh, have a look at, at uh, uh, software reuse which is, is a, uh, an activity where we try to, to minimize our effort uh, when uh, uh, implementing a system. And, and it's tightly connected to, to software design, so uh, um, it fits uh, uh, well with the topic for today's lecture. But uh, software design, well, uh, it's uh, all about trying to take the, the uh, problem that we, we model with our requirements, uh, behavioral models uh, for our uh, the functionality in our system or other types of specification for 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 the qualities and try to to describe a solution uh, for for the, for the problem I also put up understand the solution because remember that this is a is a group activity so so software design is about communication within the development team so that you guys make decisions, document decisions uh, in a way that, that you can align the team's effort. So what we've seen so far is, is uh, an abstract notion of, of design decision. Uh, looking more at general high-level principles for, for structuring a solution using different architectural patterns or applying specific tactics to, to, to address uh, quality concerns like authentication or, or, or something like that. But when you design your system, you're, you're you're so close to to uh, to the implementation that it, now it's time to 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 bring in the the implementation language and 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 if you decide to use certain frameworks or certain uh, technologies, well, you, you, they will be part of the tools that you use to describe your solution. Uh, so 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 now it's time to bring them in. Uh, what we're considering uh, here in this class are, are in principle, uh, an object-oriented solution, an object-based solution, and, and uh, well, that can be described in, in an object-based language, like, like uh, uh, where, where you just have the objects and put them together describe how they c communicate or we have like object oriented but which has a, a slightly different approach with uh, more uh, type checking and so on but it's in principle what we can say is that we consider a system to be a set of interacting objects that's how we describe our solution and it's, this is very close to, to the implementation language where you your code describes objects and how they uh, send messages, how they interact. Uh, so the, the, the fact that we're bringing in the implementation technology, it means that we must start making the decisions about, well, language, database technology, frameworks for, for user interface, etc. Uh, architectural level, but 
decisions that will have a great impact on the detailed design. So how do we get from use case to code? Well, uh, was it last week or, or so when we talked about use cases to, to, to model the behavior of a system, uh, a prescriptive modeling where we said, okay, we would like a system that, that functions like this, okay? Uh, how do you get from there to code? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that, that it's difficult to make it in, 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 in just one step. For all use cases, that is definitely not a simple uh, step to take. Uh, so we need to, well, have some intermediate, uh, some, uh, some activity in between that, that helps us in, in a step-by-step -step manner translate the prescriptive use case into a system implemented in some language that behaves like the use case prescribes. Uh, so what we need to do is, is to, to uh, first select the implementation technologies because they, they will be decisive for, for how and what we use to, to model the solution. But then the design is to, to use this toolbox that we get from, from frameworks, middlewares, etc., and the languages, and, and combine, well, creating a static model first uh, of user-defined types, classes. These classes will reuse other classes or objects provided by frameworks and middlewares. And then you have your own, your use of defined types that will use them. And you then take this static model, what you have, and describe how objects that you instantiate from these types, classes, how they interact in order to, to, to implement the behavior as, as described by the use cases. So that is in principle mapping, mapping the algorithm, the, the flow of events in, in a use case onto objects in your implementation language. That's how we go from use case to design. And this mapping is the design activity. OK. So uh, in a process model, this is the, the, the unified process. Well, you can see that the. Uh, Analysis and design. Design activity takes off in the uh, elaboration phase. So, so it's here where your design work starts. And if you look at the details for the elaboration phase, it says establish the system's baseline architecture. OK. So what it says is that focus on the most important parts of your system. And then when you have this stable entity, the architecture, you can move on in the next phase to add more and more functionality to it. But what you do here is that you will start your design activities but with, with the focus on the parts of your system that are critical. That means that if they are not solved, if you don't have that in your implementation at the end of the project, the product will be a failure. So part of this game is, is also to understand the requirements better. 
Uh, we need more insight. The, the, the use cases we have is a, a fairly rough description of the system, but we can use them to discuss with our stakeholders, our customers and so on, to improve the understanding and, and use that input to improve our designs. So during the elaboration, we move from requirements to an implementation, an implementation of this core of the application. And the reason was, as well you might remember from one of the first lectures, that we want to reduce risks first, and when we have this stable baseline architecture, we can start to add value for the customers. Okay, so just think of this example. You remember the, the chat server example. This is a, a robustness diagram, just depicting how different use cases can be realized in terms of interacting objects. So the big question here is, well, how will we get from here to code? And it's not just that these two guys up here are chatting. Software design is a lot about chatting. It's a lot about discussion in the team. Because what you see here is not just a description of really abstract objects interacting, it's also a lot of questions that must find answers before you can implement your system. So what type of questions must be answered before we uh, can implement the system? Well, there are lots of questions. For instance, this form up here, register user form, what would it look like? What should it look like? How should it be implemented? Which objects will make up this form? How will the objects interact? That's one example of some questions that you must answer with your design. Okay? Because remember that we're still decomposing. We're still decomposing. So what we're talking about here are several objects of different type that will interact. So, so in order to, to uh, realize, to implement this, this, this huge form object, we need to come up with our own user-defined types, we need to reuse types from, from a framework, reuse types from a platform that, that interfaces another platform. So, so to find quest, the answers to the questions here, we may have to go out and look for them by deciding that, okay, we go for this framework, or we will use that platform. Another example is, okay, this form validation. What is our strategy for form validation? What would it look like? Well, there will be objects in this control object. There will be additional objects in there that are responsible for validating the information in this form. But what will it look like? Which objects will be in there? How will they work together to validate the form. Another set of questions that must be answered. More? Well, over at this end, we have an entity object representing information about users. So, what type of information must be stored about users. 
how should the information be stored? How, should, how can we retrieve, how can we query the system for, for, for information about users? Another set of questions that you must find answers to. Down here, communication with the mail server. What mail server? How do we interface with the mail server? Which objects are involved in this boundary class? Which objects are involved in this control object to communicate with this external mail server? How do we interface? Another set of questions that must be answered. And here we had a cancellation after three days if the user didn't confirm the registration. How, you how can you deal with that? There are many different ways of, of, of every third day or every day go through and look for three day old registration still pending. You must design that algorithm. You must answer the question how this should be done in your system. And the reason for that is the same as on the architectural level. System integrity. Because the whole idea here is that you should be able to, to, to branch out. Have individual programmers working on parts of this, remember that this will be an iterative, incremental development, which means that in different iterations, different developers will add increments to your user-defined types here, add behavior to your system. So if you don't decide upon how these objects should behave, what the interfaces of these objects should be, it will be a nightmare when you put them back together. So what you have to do is restrict the design space before people start working on the implementation so that you will have a system that consists of parts that fit together. So uh, there are many questions to answer. There are more questions to answer. Remember some of the architectural questions that we have been briefly discussing on the previous lectures. What should the system structure look like? How do we deal with the architectural significant requirements like authentication that we've been spending a lot of time on. But it's also what technologies will be used. And today, as I said before, we will spend some time at the, the end of today's lecture on software reuse. Because reuse is not, it shouldn't be a straightforward thing. It should be a an activity that involves, well, considera consideration where you evaluate your options before you start making decisions about what to use. Because you need to do, well, decide at some point, should we develop it ourselves or should we try to find something that we can reuse? So remember that one of the reasons why it's so important that we go through this in a systematic manner is that this is an iterative process. We will come back and do more design, do more implementation, more validation in each iteration, and we will understand the system better as it evolves, and we will understand, the users will understand the system better as it evolves. So we will have to take in changed requirements, we will have to 
we do work and that's why it's so important that you approach this step by step not trying to go directly from use cases to code because that will just make life more difficult for you at the end of the day so each iteration will provide more capability an increment and more detail also an increment so you remember software architecture just to repeat the system decomposition focusing on the system concerns and these are of course very important at the beginning of the software design process where we make these decisions that impact the, more or less the entire entire system and we make them to preserve integrity so uh, just a recap of this slide because this is true not just for the architectural decisions they are also true for the detailed design decisions you will decompose but some decisions must be made together. Say that you have two objects that will communicate. You must agree upon the interface for the communication before you can go forward with the development. An example of a decision before you can go on with your work. So, uh, we'll not spend too much time on this, uh, just another example. But moving on to detail design. Well, system integrity was the, was the goal for the architectural level. But what you will try to, to, to focus on now, what is the goal for your detail design? Well, it's an optimized solution, an optimal solution. An optimal solution means that, uh, well, an optimal solution on the local level, because we have made a couple of decisions here. So now we're talking about how, what it will be the most efficient implementation of this cancellation after three days. What would be, be the most optimal solution for the uh, uh, sending out this uh, confirmation email? What would be the most efficient approach for, for storing and retrieving information about users in the system? So uh, where do we start? Well. The very, oh, sh I shouldn't say the, the most straightforward approach is to try to map your use cases, the behavior described, prescribed by the use cases. Try to map that onto collaborating objects. If you, if you look at the use case description, at the flow of events, the flow of events corresponds to messages exchanged by objects. So, so it's not a far-fetched approach in that sense that you go from one prescriptive model that involves objects or entities sending, interacting with each other to another representation where you have this, this uh, computer science concept, the object where each and every object has a state and some behavior. And they can exchange, they can affect each other by sending messages. So if you look at the, the boundary class, the boundary objects uh, that we're talking about, we talked about, they're responsible for, for interacting with end users, possibly through some, some gra graphical user interface. They are uh, responsible for some communication, some input-output to the system. 
And this high-level boundary object that we have seen so far in our robustness diagrams, well, an object will have an interface. But that interface can be implemented in many different ways. And it will be your task to come up with a design for a solution to what we expect from that boundary object. And the same hold for, for, holds for the, for the entity objects. Say that we have this, this user entity. How will you store information about users? Will it be in a database? Will it be in an object structure? Will it be in a plain text file or an XML file? Or How will you make the information accessible for, for, for the other objects in your system? Will it be, well, if you have a database solution, you will find support from the database management system. But if you choose your own homebrew solution, well, you have to provide behavior for, for searching, for uh, updating, for deleting, for adding new user entities. And when it comes to the control, you have to come up with the, the right algorithm for how to connect what's going on in the boundary objects with the information in the entity objects. So now we come down to the, to the implementation language. How do you, how do you express a, a design? Well, what do, you have, what do you have in your implementation language? Well, if it's Java, we talk about classes, and we talk about objects. Classes are used to describe several similar objects. In JavaScript, we talk about user-defined types that you can use to instantiate objects, OK? The objects described in the classes has behavior and state, OK? So how do you express, how do you specify behavior of objects? In the methods. And where do you express and how do you express the state? in the attributes, in the variables, in, well, whatever you choose to call it. So you will define, you will describe your design you saying classes, because you don't want to describe each and every object. You want to describe the type, the methods, the attributes. But then, some behavior, uh, well, we're not just talking about simple behaviors here, like setting or getting a, a value from an attribute. Some behaviors can be more difficult. For instance, it could be pattern recognition. That's not a straightforward one. That's an algorithm that requires some design. Then we talk about data structures. Say that you have loads of data in a database, but you want to be a little bit closer to the data when you do your uh, pattern recognition. So you need some smart data structure. OK, so you need to design a data structure and algorithms for manipulating the data in the data structures. So detailed design is about coming up with a structure in terms of user-defined types, defining the objects, describing the objects, that, well, what you have in your toolbox. And then 
When you have done that, well, you have defined the interface for your object. So now you can go in and provide the implementation, the algorithms and the data structures. So what you can see now is that, well, we come from this very high level abstract object, boundary control entity. We make decisions about how to implement them how to further decompose them into additional objects using different implementation technologies. Which GUI framework will we use? Which uh, interface to the mail server will we use? Which persistency technology will we use? And as you make these decisions, well, each and every one of these will provide you with additional behavior. If it's object-oriented technology, it's typically in terms of types that you can instantiate to objects. And these objects can be woven together with your user-defined objects in your designs. So if you look at the design process, Design is all the way from architecture level to implementation. And what you will see next week is that there is actually some design involved in validation too. You have to design the classes you use, the objects you use for testing. But what we're trying to, to uh, do here is, 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 well, our architecture design primarily focus on reducing risk. Make the decisions regarding persistency, interface, how we structure the application, which are the, what is the core functionality in our application, allocate responsibilities to the subsystems we have. For the subsystems, move on, start doing the detail design. Which objects are required to implement the behavior this subsystem promises in its interface? When that is decided, you can move on to the implementation. Provide the code for the design. Implement the attributes, implement the behavior in the methods. Starting from a high level, coming down to the lower levels, iterate, improve incrementally. That's the way you do it. And at some point, you will start adding more value to your system. So, so as, as, as a teacher, it's a nightmare to, to uh, describe something that is iterative and incremental and that involves several of these activities. But I hope you understand that, that when we design a system like uh, this, we have to make decisions as we understand the system better and better. We cannot make all the decisions up front and implement it. We will have to make it iteratively, adding more complexity for each iteration, making more decisions, and incrementally build, imp incrementally design and construct our, our product. So, so, for this high-level description of a small part of the behavior prescribed by the use cases for this chat server, you remember the questions that this little snippet of behavior raised? And if you look at the entire functionality of the system, well, the approach will be the same. Pick one of these objects, pick one of these system behaviors, really, and see what do I need to, 
provide a system that provides this behavior. Okay? Part of that will be identifying ad additional objects with more detailed behavior and it will result in one of these decision hierarchies where you make decisions about the objects involved, the technology you will use to implement them, the structure for how the objects relate to each other, how they interact and at the end of the day, the algorithms, the data structures. So, example. What would this form look like? Think of the decisions at the architectural level here. What type of GUI? What type of interface first? Should it be a graphical user interface? Yeah. If you asked that question 25 years ago, most people would have said, oh, a text interface. Yeah. These days, graphical user interface. But the second one, should it be a, a web? Or should it be a web solution? Uh, should it be a... a, a a, a monolith uh, native client for for or should it be a mobile uh, possibly a cross platform development you have to make these decisions and you have well the answer somewhere near either in the the requirements document or you just go and ask the customer because at the end of the day, they have to pay. So if you go for one client or if you go for 10 different clients for different platforms, well, there's a cost attached to it. The technology you pick will impact what type of responsibilities you have to allocate to, to to, uh, to your system, what type of objects will be involved in your solution. And there's more to it. When you pick your implementation technology, you have to understand how that works. And it's often the case that, for instance, if you, if you pick a, a framework, for some language. That framework will narrow down your design space. You have to like accept the fact that, well, in our in this framework, this, for instance, a user interface framework, they have certain patterns, certain structures that your solution must be aligned to must adhere to so that you cannot come up with your own solution and then try to well put it together with some existing framework no way the frameworks are built in a way that here is what we can do if you want to reuse this you have to accept some of the rules and if you accept the rules well that will restrict how you can design your system When it comes to the, to, the, to the user interface, there is a, well, huge community around user interface design. I'm not an expert in that field. I will not go near that. Uh, but the simple thing here is, is, well, you have to come up with a, well, what the user interface should look like and then look at well which objects are involved in this user interface and user interfaces are well graphical entities there is information in there and there is also behavior so if you go and look at the user interface like this one up here Sorry for this not so nice uh, uh, 
mock-up, but it's a it's good enough mock-up to explain how the register new user interface, what it should look like. But if you look at, at this, there are some, some, some graphical, there are some, some boundary objects in here, like this, this, this label here. That's, that's something that visually communicates with the user, you see? And there is some uh, objects in here that, that contains uh, information. Like, uh, well, this text field here. So you can almost think of this as an entity, okay? And then there are objects that are more responsible for the behavior, like this button here, you see? So we took this boundary object, okay? this form. And in this mock-up here, we can see that inside this boundary object, we will have objects responsible for visualizing the form. There will be objects responsible for the information in the form. And there will be objects responsible for the form's behavior. You see? So, We can further decompose this boundary object into several objects. Again, a hierarchy. And down here, you see the static structure, the class structure for uh, uh, the standard uh, framework provided by, by Java for uh, for graphical user interfaces. Not the complete, just like a snippet of it. But the fact, here, the problem here, the challenge here is that, okay, we make the decision that, assuming that we're implementing in Java, we go for the standard interface provided by the language. Okay, that decision restricts us. Because now, we have to accept the fact that well, we'll be talking about windows and panels as our containers. There will be different uh, specializations of, of the window type. And if you want to work function, or your application, I should say, should work within that framework, well, you ha have to accept these rules. So your user-defined types, your classes, will be specializations, will inherit from these classes, from these types. You see? And now we're just at the first question, still. But GUI design, as I said, it's not my, my cup of tea. Uh, but just show you some, some, some golden rules. And, and uh, informative feedback, easy reversal of actions. There are some good or best practices. But what is this, really, for you as designers? Additional questions. How should we achieve consistency in our user interface? What does consistency mean? Well, you know that, that some, some platform uh, vendors, some operating system uh, providers, they, they, they give you sh guidelines. If you develop applications for our ecosystem, you have to adhere to these uh, design rules. Okay? If you don't, you're out. That's fine. If you're in a situation like that, of course, this rule book or guidebook or whatever you choose to call it will force you 
to make a couple of design decisions. You must design a user interface that looks like and behaves like prescribed by this book. So I know that, that some of you don't like rules because it well, restricts you in your creativity and so on. But just to show you in a couple of examples, there are some, the user interface Hall of Shame, I think it's still around, I haven't looked, at, looked it up this year. Well, these are the not so good uh, user interfaces. I, I, my personal favorite is this one. Uh, if you're not colorblind, color is part of communication. And of course, yes should be green. But if you ask a question, are you sure you want to delete all records from the database? What is the natural behavior for a human being? To move on and press the green. But should it be in this case? Well, you guys, there are better examples. The UIPatterns.com, go there uh, and learn. Uh, time for a break. Let's take 10, okay? Thank you. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, let's continue. Uh, after this uh, excessive use of, of uh, the tab control, uh, let's move on and, and uh, look at the next question. What are the validation rules for this? Uh, well, at the architectural level, for the usability, you guys must agree upon, well, common rules, common mechanisms for all forms. Because what if one form allows one format for whatever number or while some other form uses a completely different rule. Again, a decision you must make so that you have consistency throughout the system. Another one is, is how to communicate uh, error, message, error messages. Validation will happen, well, in many objects, in an in a system where you have uh, well, an interactive system like this. You must agree upon these before you start to work on them because all objects should have a similar behavior. Uh, so how can you do this? Well, you can, you, can, you can go out and look for, for frameworks that will provide you with objects, help you doing this. And, and, and many of these user interface frameworks have that support already. Or if you prefer the homebrew uh, solutions, well, you can do it yourself. You, you can define your own structure based on, on a on, a, on a, some design pattern like this where you have, for all fields, there is a connected validator object. So, so as soon as a field is updated, well, the validator object validates the field. So, so with that structure, you can see that you, can, you have your two user-defined types here. Uh, they are abstract, so, so it means that you don't really, they're not intended to, to, to uh, you're not intended to instantiate the objects for them, but they're mere like uh, templates that you can specialize, so you can create uh, more concrete, uh, concrete uh, uh, types here that you, you can instantiate as objects. So for your field, you will have this validator. So it means that, uh, you spend some more time on implementing things, but you get it as you want. But this is always like a trade-off. Is it worth it? Yes or no? If it's worth it, you do it. If it's not worth it, reuse. 
Moving on, now we come to the big thing here. How is data managed? I don't expect you guys to, to look at the, 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 the graphics on, 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 uh, on the right-hand side here. It's just a number of user-defined types with intricate uh, uh, relationships. I just want to say one thing, and that is that this is a very simple model. For a reasonable size system, we're talking about hundreds, possibly thousands of user-defined types classes. Not all of them must be stored somewhere. Not all of them, not all objects of these classes must be, be available, at all, available at all times. But what you have to think of at the architectural level is what type of technology is required for, for, for accessing, for storing data in our system. And this can be for a small system, ah, not much. We need some, some uh, we don't have any persistent data. We just have uh, trans transient data that we, uh, well, as soon as we execute our application, we load data from, uh, or someone enters data and we process that data, fine. No storing needed. Then you probably just need some smart data structures to manipulate the data. But if you have persistent data, you have to think about, OK, should we go for a database management system? Should we store it on files? Should we have some file-based database? There is a long list of options here. Should we have some caching to, to, to reduce the time for, for to access data that we use more frequently? What is that cache? What does that look like? Well, it depends on your application. Should there be support for transactions so that we, if something goes wrong, that we can reverse? Some computations? Well, architectural level decisions. Well, here, backup. What about backup? How, how can we guarantee that we can access data even if our uh, persistent storage breaks? Do we have a backup policy? Is that automated or is it managed manually? Those questions must be answered. But when we have decided, hey, say let's go for a database, okay. What will be the impact for the designers? Well, you have to design first and foremost, well, say that you go for a, a relational database. Then we're going to talk about schemas, relations, tables with rows and columns for storing data. You need to design these guys. You must come up with the, well, the keys that you will use to, to, to access and to combine these tables before you start uh, looking for information and projecting on, in, in on information in, in these, these uh, tables. That's design. You make detailed design decisions. Should the schema look like this or like that? Second. How do you connect to the data? Remember that you have your, your system over here with, with your user-defined, your objects that must somehow access the data stored in the database. How do you do that? Well, there are a number of different technologies for doing that. The database managers provide you with different tools for doing that. And again, a decision about the technology will limit your design space. There are examples of, 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 of systems that creates like an abstraction of the database. So you don't really have to care about how the database is implemented. That is taking care of a persistency framework, like Hibernate, if you heard about that. 
And again, since you're I introducing existing technology, these guys have decided that if you want to use our framework, you have to behave. So we have some rules. And these rules are typically encoded as, as, as design patterns. So your design will have to be aligned with these design rules. OK, talked quite a bit about this one. Well, if you go for different client types, it might be different implementation languages, different frameworks, different development environments, different, 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 lots of things will be different. So, uh, some support for, for cr cross-platform design can be, well, provided on the, uh, on the architecture level. You can go for some language that comes with a set of libraries for cr cross-platform developments. You can develop for different client types, just writing the code once and then generate for the different uh, platforms. But again, if you, if you want to do it your way, you can do it your way, but then you must design your own cross-platform part with the native parts, set up your own development environment, keeping these concerns separated if you want to get it exactly your way, you have to do it. Otherwise, you have to decide to adjust to what someone else is providing to you in a cross-platform uh, uh, framework. So a little bit more on, on, on this, because it shows you a bit uh, that a decision will force your design in, in, in some direction. So, so this is how do you communicate with the, the mail server. So we have in, in our chat application a, a behavior that says that when a user submits a form, and this form goes through the validation successfully, it will be a pending registration. And this pending registration uh, is pending until the user confirms it. So we notify the user that someone has submitted information, so there is a pending registration, and we do that with an email. So how do you create and send emails? Well, what is an email? What does an email consist of? Well, in fact, it's just like text, structured in a specific format. Okay data encoded inside in a way that our, it can go through the mail servers without being corrupted and our mail clients can interpret it. You can just imagine the mess if there wasn't a standard here, you see? So it's not a big deal, no it's not, for you to, to write your own email system that is able to send and receive emails, at least the basic ones, at least a mail like the one we want to send here. It's not a big deal, really. However, why should you when we already have support for this in our operating systems? something that we know works most of the time. So instead, you say that, I, OK, I just need some kind of interface to the mail transfer protocol uh, service on my, on my platform, on my, on my hardware, or sorry, in my operating system. 
So, of course, depending upon which language you picked, there will be different frameworks giving you this support. And on the design level, this support will be a set of objects described in user defined types or, well, in Java classes. And of course, if you want to use that behavior, if you, then you have to instantiate objects of these types and send messages. Interact, your, you, your objects must interact with these objects. So what you do is that, OK, you make a decision, and then you have to follow the rules. So one example here is, is think of uh, your mail-enabled application here at the top. Well, what you have to do is you have to go and understand this API programming interface where you find support for constructing email objects. It's object-oriented technology, Java. So this will be an object. And then there are behavior objects in here that you can instantiate and access in order to uh, access the implementation layer, which is native, which is on your platform supported by your operating system. So uh, what you can see here is, is uh, it's too bad it's not UML notation, but, but it's, a, it's a hierarchy, a hierarchy of, of, of user-defined. Here we have interfaces, we have uh, classes, and then we have container classes that are, well, classes define objects that include other objects, similar to what you see in a user interface. So here you have different parts, which is an interface. And, and uh, that can be a message, or it can be a body part. And you can see that, OK, we construct our email using different parts. OK? And what you have to make sure is that when you design the part of your code that is responsible for sending out the email, it constructs an object according to these rules, according to this structure. And if the framework here is properly written, you cannot create something that is not correct. And then when you have something, you open up a connection and you send the email. OK? So you see, you, you make a decision. And that decision will force you to make decisions within that framework. What else do we have to consider? Well, on which platforms should our software run? We talked a little bit about this when we talked about the clients, but now we also talk about, well, is there a server side for the chat application? Yes, there is. Which operating system do we use? What type of services do we have? Many things. What, what should we do about networking? How does that work? What kind of interfaces do we have towards the, the, the that communication part of the system. Is it provided uh, in, the, in the language we have, or should we use some other communication platform? This is so important, because it, it's at the very, it's a fundament of the pillars on top of, uh, on, on which your application will, will, will stand. So UML provide the component diagram. So I just saw some examples some week ago on, on, on this. So you, you, can, you can model your, your hardware and uh, different systems on top of the hardware. 
Okay, here we have a control class. So on the architectural level, there's not too much here to do. This is this is actually part a part of the uh, the behavior, part of the the domain, part of the chat domain. But again, there are a couple of design options here. I guess that if I if I had you guys have a go at this one. Uh, for some minutes and ask you to, okay, give me a structure of objects that interacts so that we will uh, cancel pending registrations that are more than three days old. You, you see that here you have several, well, several options, several opportunities that you, you can, you, that, well, you can do this in different ways. So you have to come up with a design where objects interact, where objects collaborate to, 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 to achieve this behavior. And for UML, well, what you see up here is a a class diagram with user-defined types, pending registrations and the user here. And you can see that we have a number of pending users. So the one object, pending registrations, contains a number of, of objects of this, this type. But how do you design? Well, now you're talking about behavior. And here we have a sequence diagram. The sequence diagram describes objects. And, and this is one way to do this. We go through all the objects referred to by the pending registrations object here. And you can see that we have a number of user objects on this side here, okay? So all, for all objects, we check the time. Have you been here for more than three days? You get a response back from this object, and if it has been there for more than three times, we dispose that object, the cross mark down here. So, we have a set of objects that has not yet been approved or confirmed by the user who received that email. Okay. So every now and then, we go through the entire set removing the ones that have been here for more than three days. That's one way to do this. Usually, now it's the time when I ask if this is the only way or even the best way. And I can only say one thing, that this is definitely not the best way. This is the was a straightforward first ones that comes to your mind solution. At least it was for me. But now when I look at it, it's, it could be done in, in a different way, much better. So uh, what do we do? Well, we decide which objects we have. We decide how these objects interact. We design a system, the behavior as described by the use case. You see, this is, this is, this is part of a flow of events, actually, that if something was older than three days, it should be thrown away, discarded. 
So this is how a part of a flow of events maps to a design. And you can, you can see that what you have here is one object sending a message to another object here. And this object most likely can be found in some collection or like a simple collection like a list or something. So you have an iterator here that you use to iterate over all objects in that collection. Sending that message, check the time for each object that the iterator gives back a reference to. And then you have an if statement. If you got this response, discard that object. Mo remove it from the collection. Next object in the collection. You see, we're getting closer to code now, much closer than we were before when we had the flows of events in our use case. Okay, so uh, what do we do next? Well, the system level structure. We must make some decisions now, high level, architectural, uh, because that will have a huge impact on how we structure the application, what type of methods our classes must provide, at least, well, some of our classes that will be part of the boundaries. So let's say that we will write a very simple uh, application here with some browser clients. We will have some HTTP here. We have some, some says web service here. It could be like a RESTful API service here. It running on, on our, uh, uh, in an application server on the web server here. Then we have some, some applications back here that, well, in this case, runs on a mainframe, a big one, a big computer. Okay. So the interface here will consist of get, post, put, and delete routes that maps to the URL. So the web browser will interact selecting behavior from the system by posting, by retrieving, putting, deleting, We have more. Should we uh, make it secure? Should we have encrypted communication? What should we do with data? Well, the decisions we make here will impact the structure and also how the interfaces of the applications, the, the, the user-defined types, at least some of them, how, what, what they look like, what will be the entry point to the behaviors we have in our system. And again, is this the best one? No. There's probably other ways that are better, but, but just to give you a, something that is uh, close to what you're currently doing. OK, so what we've done so far today is, is, is looking at the different types of decision we, decisions we make throughout this design process that, that well, at, in the beginning, we try to make all the big decisions regarding implementation technology, application structure, and so on. And then uh, as we make our iteration, finish our iterations, going down the decision tree, so to speak, we will make more and more of the detailed design decisions concerning how we implement user interfaces, how we communicate with external systems, how we use reuse the, the different platforms, frameworks, and so on, so that we have decided to, 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 to use. 
So, so a theme for today has, to a large extent, been software reuse. Because the only way to, to uh, develop a complex system is to reuse. Reuse what others have done and packaged in a way that you guys can reuse it rather easily. We cannot reinvent everything all the time because then we will never ever produce something and we will never ever have something that can coexist with anything else. So design and, and software reuse are, are really tightly connected. And, and part of the, the design activities, primarily at the high level, the architectural level, is concerned with figuring out what can be reused and what should we develop ourselves. And then look at the options you have. Okay, let's say that we're, gonna, we're not going to develop our own user interface. We're going to reuse something. But what is that something? Well, that something must be something that matches your business goals, the product requirements, the user needs, and, well, to some extent, also the development team's expertise. And when it comes to, to reuse, it's not just about build them or reuse them or buy them. It's much more. So if you look at reuse and architecture, well, architecture provided us with the high-level decomposition of a system into subsystems. And if you just look at, well, the undivided whole, the system, it's not that easy to start reasoning about what can be reused and what should we develop ourselves. But when you have the first decomposition, you can start to reason about, okay, this client on this side, How should that be realized? What type of technology should we use for that? The persistency over at this end, how should that be realized? What can we use or reuse for that? So architecture is an excellent starting point, point for start, for, for, to begin reason about reuse. Start looking for reusable components that you can take into your design and eventually reuse the implementations, of course. So when we talk about reuse, there are different types of reuse. Reuse of applications. Well, spreadsheets. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but there are millions of applications written for spreadsheets as macros or uh, small code objects that provide additional behavior using, function, using behavior provided by the APIs of these uh, applications. And sure, if that shortcut takes you quickly to the goal. Why shouldn't you reuse it? It will save you days, weeks, months. Your customer will be happy. And remember, well, if your system is something that a customer wants quickly and they will tell you that we're going to use this for five months, then we will drop it. If you can come up with a spreadsheet solution that takes you two weeks, you know your customer will use it for five months. Why should you spend time on user interface, storage, all this and that, when you have it, or at least the things you need in that application? So. On the application level, you can actually reuse entire applications. 
just changing parts of them, the configurable behavior that you can control. But when we talk about reuse, and I talk to students about reuse, the most common type of reuse is the one that students will never admit to. That is when you guys end up on, on uh, the internet finding a solution to a problem that you think is similar to the problem you have and you copy and you paste two lines of code. That's reuse. And that's fine as long as you understand it. But if you copy too much, you don't understand it. So the most common type of, of, of reuse is this uh, copy and paste. Is it the most effective one? No. Then we have somewhere, the, well, the one in the middle here, reuse of components. And components are, well, subsystems like the user interface classes or classes supporting a persistency layer or transaction management, a database component, something like that. So it's everything from fully functional applications that we can configure down to, well, two lines or a single line of code. So what is most beneficial to us as software developers? The opportunistic one, as soon as you see an opportunity to reuse, you reuse. Copy and paste, for instance. Is that the most efficient one? Nah, it's not. It turns out that if you're willing to invest a little bit more time and resources. Systematic reuse can actually bo boost the, the levels of reuse in your application development. And one thing we know for sure, that is that reuse, systematic reuse I should say, will reduce the cost, the cost of developing your system. It will reduce the time it takes to develop that system and it will improve the quality of that system. So there is really no reason why you shouldn't try to reuse as much as possible as long as, well, it's reasonable. So systematic reuse is something different, and I will show you some example of that later. But if it should be efficient, it should be systematic. So reuse. There are a number of different examples of, well, a technique that, that to some extent involves reuse. When you design a system, of course, you can, you can design with reuse. We talked about it today. You design with, with uh, types or classes that, that uh, will give you behavior for the behaviors for, for user interface or for accessing the mail server or whatever. But you can also, because someone has developed these frameworks, so someone has actually designed for reuse the other way. And of course, when you develop your systems, well, you know, most companies are, well, active in a specific, or in some domain or some domains, developing similar systems. So, so when you design a system for, in that company, it's quite likely that your next product will be similar. Maybe not exactly the same, but similar. So why not? If you find some type, some set of classes that you think that, I'm really proud of this. I think this is really good. And I think that we can actually make this reusable. We can make it easier for
for someone else to reuse. Well, then you have to consider design for reuse. And when we talk about generator-based reuse, what is that? What is a generator-based reuse? Well, application generators. You provide, for instance, uh, you have a, a, an editor where you can draw the elements of your graphical user interface. You push a button and the code is generated. One example. There are more examples. The principle is that you provide a configuration and then you have a generator which is a program that takes this configuration and it has a lot of code that it can generate based on these configuration. So it's like a tool that helps you to reuse. You don't have to put all the classes together, connecting them and so on, having the objects interacting in the right way. That is defined by this configuration. But application system reuse was the spreadsheet example. But if we talk about design with reuse, there are some challenges here. Architecture, okay, we come up with an architecture, high level decomposition, responsibilities, defining the interfaces. We have some specification of a component that we can start looking for. So now we're looking for a persistency component, say, that will help us with storing information. Okay. So how do you find them? What do you think is the most common tool that developers use up here to find reusable components? A search engine. Yeah. I do it. You do it. You have a problem. Well, I need a class that can do this for me, or yeah, some type that can, or some, some, some method, or some framework. The problem is that the search engines today are not really for code. So you have to be, you have to exploit, uh, well, you have to be very precise in, in in your description. And the problem is that there is absolutely no quality, quality control whatsoever on the results because it's just text. So you don't know if the first hit you get is the worst one that you will hit. It can be that bad. So there is no quality ranking. But still, when you found something, what is the probability that this will be a perfect match for the rest of your architecture? Will it keep, preserve the integrity of your system? Most likely not. Most components will require some kind of adaptation. And the true story here is that most reusable components will force you to adapt your system the other components in your system will now have to coexist and the only way to coexist is to do it the way they do it. But then we can incorporate the component or we can incorporate our components with this reusable component we just found. And the thing is that the bigger the component is you reuse, the more likely it is that you have to adopt. If it's just a class, you can get it into your design. But if it's a framework, your design must adjust to the framework rules. Oops. Yeah, OK, it was the same title. That was why I wasn't confused. So the algorithm here is 
find the right component. I love this one. Find the right component. That's your task. It's not easy. You typically have a set of components that you have used and reused and you have some friend or someone who just started at the company who used to work with some components. So it's more like hearsay than engineering here. If you go out and ask industry, why are you using this framework? Do you think they have a good answer? No. It's, yeah, it works. Well, it was fairly, do you know of something else that could work, that could be better? No, 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 we, we stick to this one because it works. But finding the right component is challenging. And, and, and the answer to, 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 to make it easier to find the right components is to develop a reuse organization. Because the problems with reuse is to find the good and reu reusable components. Because components can be difficult to understand. If we talk about a single class, it's not a prob problem. But if we talk about a framework, it's more challenging. If we talk about a, a, a distribution with virtualization, running different servers and clients, connecting code with application servers, it's difficult to understand. The assignments you're working with right now, well, you reuse. You reuse code, you reuse complete components, subsystems. And I know that some of you find it very hard to understand how things fit together and how they work. So methods are okay, classes are still okay, subsystems not that easy. There's more to it. We have the not invented here, and for some reason the text is under the cloud, but most people are a bit reluctant to reuse what others have, have developed. This is not really the truth today. I think that we're all so used to, to, to reuse. We don't think of it as reuse, but, but still, in some organizations, they are very reluctant to you, reuse something that is, for instance, open source. Because what are the guarantees? Instead, they pay up big bucks for, for well, repackaged open source. So when you develop for reuse, it's important that you have, well, this is, this is not easy, so I will not go through the details, but you will not know how someone will reuse your component. So you have to set up the rules. You have to, be, you have to make sure that if I don't know how people can, how, how someone will reuse it, I have to set up the rules so that I can guarantee that it will work that no one can misuse it. So that's why we have the patterns. That's why we have different qualifiers that says that this class cannot be specialized, etc. So uh, when you develop these components, it's not just about the individual components, it's also setting the rules for how they are used, or can be reused, I should say. So. How do you do this? You must have some oracle answering what should be included. What type of variability, configurability should be supported? That is answering how will anyone reuse my software? And there is no answer to this. In addition, you must have an, a structure. Patterns, naming conventions, naming for, of methods, constructors, operators, exception handling, generics, templates, all this and that must be defined for your design so that you have a coherent, reusable asset. One way to achieve this for a single organization is something called software product lines. It combines development for reuse and development with reuse. And what you do is that you install a two-level process where you have guys working just with the domain. You remember what I said before, that typically a, a company is active in one domain, gaming, for instance. So what they do is that they develop reusable assets here for games. 
But then they have several games on the market. So for each and every game, they do something down here. And what they do here is that they just add what's specific to a specific game. In that way, it's not uncommon to see companies that have reuse levels of 80 to 90 percent. Next time, we're going to talk more about something called knowledge reuse, design patterns, architectural patterns, software patterns. So there will be some examples of the Gang of Four design patterns for creational, structural, behavioral uh, aspects of, of object-based structures. But takeaways from today. Design decisions at different levels. When we talk about iterative and incremental, we primarily, in the first iterations, focus on the architectural decisions. And then as we come down a bit in the decision tree, our decisions are more focused on design. But the rule of thumb is to create something stable, get the system up, and then start adding the features of the system. Reuse when you can, and develop for reuse when you can afford it. Okay, so see you guys next week. Thank you.